Continuing on from the international success of Our Little Sister, director Hirokazu Koreeda has hit a winning streak of one film released to theaters per year. And while Our Little Sister was nominated at Cannes, swept the Japanese Academy Awards, and won accolades all over the globe, this was arguably not Koreeda's most successful film in the latter half of the 2010s. 2017's The Third Murder garnered 10 nominations and 6 wins at the Academy Awards. 2018's Shoplifters did two better with 15 nominations and 8 wins alongside a Best Foreign Language nomination for the American Oscars. 2019's project, Koreeda's French-English debut, The Truth, is too new to say. We'll get back to you on that one. You might notice, though, that we skipped a year in the process here. That's because today's subject, After the Storm, was Koreeda's release from 2016. You might think of it as something of a sophomore slump for his recent releases, at least in terms of critical reception. The film is well-liked enough, with releases all over the world and at various festivals, yet it managed to not garner any Japanese Academy Awards. This may be for a number of reasons, though the top two we can come up with are that either 1. No one was super excited for another family drama by Koreeda so soon after Our Little Sister, or 2. Because 2016 was the year when Shin Godzilla was absolutely decimating the Academy Awards and the box office. Shin Godzilla only earned something like, oh, you know, 15 times what After the Storm earned globally? Regardless of the reason, After the Storm has sort of faded into the background amongst the other heavy hitters of Koreeda's recent winning streak, which makes it ripe for the picking today on Cinema Nippon. We mentioned before that this is another family drama from the man who, for a lot of us, is known as one of the preeminent directors of the genre working today. It would be disingenuous, however, to say that Our Little Sister and After the Storm are the same movie. The former is a somewhat meandering, taking things at its own pace, character study of three adult-aged sisters adopting their teenage sister and how she adapts to their way of life in a sleepy seaside town. The latter, meanwhile, is remarkably more dramatic, dealing primarily with a divorced couple, Ryota and Kyoko, and Ryota's attempts to be part of their son, Shingo's life. In other words, it takes place, after the storm, of their tumultuous marriage, as the two partners try to come to terms with one another. Additionally, we're given perspective on their relationship dynamic thanks to the presence of Ryota's sister, Chinatsu, and his mother, Yoshiko. Primarily, After the Storm seems to survey these various frayed bonds between these family members, as they are all forced to spend a night together due to an impending massive storm. When we're introduced to our main man Ryota, he's fresh off the train, back home from his father's funeral. Ryota is, in short, a deadbeat father looking for money as an unsuccessful novelist. Ryota's deep lore is that he won an award for his writing once 15 years earlier, and has yet to produce a follow-up to his breakthrough. Part of his character arc is deciding how he might approach the remainder of his career. As it turns out, he meets with someone who offers Ryota the opportunity to write manga, so that he might break back into authorship and make some cash in the process. Most of what we need to know about how Ryota views himself, and how vain he is, comes from his flat refusal to take up the manga gig, seeing as how he's too proud to write comics. Instead, Ryota makes almost a career in and of itself to pretend he's actively writing constantly. In reality, Ryota makes occasional money as a private investigator. Meanwhile, he tells his sister, Chinatsu, that he's quit being a PI and is still writing, gearing up to produce a full novel in no time. The audience would be forgiven if they assumed he had mentioned this more than once to Chiatsu. His relationship is further strained by Chinatsu because of how both kids interact with their mother. Ryota doesn't get along with their mother, Yoshiko, as it is, but he expresses fear that Yoshiko might be exploited by Chinatsu. Yoshiko receives pension checks from the government thanks to her age, while Chinatsu seeks money for her daughter's figure skating lessons. Ryota might be easily described as a deadbeat, but he could equally be described as a late bloomer who has been sneaking into houses for research for novels, thanks to his private investigator job. Depending on the audience's perspective, Ryota could be someone with a rain cloud over his head, the source of all his own problems, or someone who has dealt a bad hand in life. For this reason, viewers will likely be split on how they feel about Ryota. 
This is expounded upon with how Ryota acts as a private investigator while skimming additional cash off the top before turning in his dues. Comparisons can be readily made between Ryota and his deceased father, who we learn was both a liar and a gambler. Yet we also see that Ryota has the hubris to think he's better than his old man. What's more, he's so broke and so insistent on maintaining a good image that he spends the money he steals on his son directly, rather than on child support payment he owes to his divorced wife. At one point, Ryota even speaks on stalkers being exclusively men, yet he continues to stalk his estranged wife using his writer and private investigator skills. In a word, Ryota's publisher, his family, and even his son all know he's a deadbeat. Heck, the fact that Ryota didn't receive custody of Shingo shows that society thinks of him as a deadbeat given that Japanese custody courts are notorious for favoring fathers over mothers. The next character of note here is Ryota's and Chinatsu's mother, Yoshiko, an elderly woman who has just lost her husband. Ryota thinks of her as helpless, but as with Kirin Kiki's other character in Shoplifters, she is a strong old gal. What's more, in spite of how Ryota treats Yoshiko, Yoshiko treats him exceptionally well. In one scene, she and Ryota bond over homemade ice cream. This shows us that even if Chinatsu finds him insufferable, Yoshiko likes Ryota. Even if he's a total loser by his sister's count, their mom can't help but care for him. Showing front and center how strong Mama Yoshiko is, we also have the elephant in the room that is addressed almost right out of the gate. We learn quickly that Yoshiko has made peace with never having really liked her husband, who has only just been buried. In a way, it feels like she was waiting for him to pass before she finally started living for herself, which she has definitely done. Yoshiko is in a learning club with a widower with whom she may have a burgeoning romance. There are no bones about it, Yoshiko is moving on with her life in spite of her deceased husband. In the end, it turns out that Yoshiko's initial discontent with her husband may have been a bit understated. In fact, you might say that Yoshiko hated her husband. Toward the close of the film, in commenting on Ryota's and Kyoko's broken marriage, Yoshiko says, quote, People give up so easily today, can't they get back together? End quote. This opens up an interesting dialogue concerning the generational gap between mother and son, which the film never really delves into, just kind of leaving it for the viewer to consider. We're shown in reminiscences about the past that mother and son have grown together before growing apart, commenting on the changes to their neighborhood that have occurred since Ryota moved out. Yet, when we consider Yoshiko's comments on how she stuck with her husband in spite of hating him, we're presented with the reality that dating and marriage, well, they ain't what they used to be. The other exceptionally important character in this scenario is Ryota's ex-wife, Kyoko, who resents Ryota for all his faults and all the seemingly false pretenses under which she married and had a child with him. And yet, in spite of all these faults, Kyoko tolerates Ryota for one reason or another. Whether that be in service of their son, Shingo, or due to her not completely hating him as Yoshiko did her late husband, we're never sure. The film's narrative is told primarily from Ryota's perspective, meaning that Kyoko's thoughts and intentions are largely obscure to us, except when they directly contradict his own. Perhaps her tolerance of him could be seen as an argument for the benefit of divorce in situations like this. Maybe these two are more functional as people and as adults when compared with their elders. However, this never seems to be fully borne out. It would appear, based on their interactions with one another and with Shingo, that Kyoko sees Ryota as only acting his part of a father once per month, the times in which he's allowed and required to do so. Kyoko has primary custody over Shingo, but Ryota is meant to pay child support fees and occasionally play his role as a dad. It's pretty clear, given their squabbles throughout the film, that Kyoko doesn't see him as a real father figure. After all, she divorced him for his issues, and she has no qualms calling him out on why she left him, which she does time and again. Ryota, on the other hand of the equation, says that the times in which they were married were the problem. He more or less refuses to take any flack for his own faults, instead diverting his own problems and blaming the world. Nothing is ever his fault, like the proverbial rain cloud boy we mentioned before, instead meaning that he's simply been dealt a really awful hand in life. It's either his mother's fault, his dad's, his sister's, Kyoko's fault, and on and on. Kyoko, on the other hand, seems as though she's become a bit jaded thanks to her relationship with Ryota, 
She comments at one point that men can't love the present, they only want the future and their dreams. This comes alongside an especially biting comment in regards to how Ryota keeps attempting to regain Kyoko's affections. As she puts it, quote, Missing someone after they're gone won't help. You have to deal with people in the present. End quote. Of course, the dual purpose of this statement becomes clear when we think of Yoshiko's hatred for her husband, but with Ryota, it's compounded, as though Kyoko is accusing him of not learning from his mother's mistakes. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we have Kyoko's and Ryota's son, Shingo, whose wishes are, unfortunately, disregarded by and large by his father. As such, in simplest terms, Shingo does not even a little bit respect Ryota. This, of course, could come as a result of his mother being the primary parent. Shingo spends so much more time with her that it would be understandable for her hatred of Ryota to rub off on their son. Or it could be that in his innocent youth, Shingo is already realizing how much of a screw-up his father is. Things come to a head when Shingo straight up tells Ryota, I'll never turn out like you. Naturally, given how defensive Ryota is about his image, he immediately fires back, it's not easy to be the man you want to be. Which gives us some insight into how Ryota is cognizant of his own failures, yet he chooses to avoid them, or run from them. It also explains to us that Shingo is the only person Ryota doesn't lie to. He might be disingenuous with his wife, his sister, and his mother, yet Ryota expresses his love for Shingo not by guarding him from the harsh world, but by being completely, brutally honest. In other words, Ryota still loves Shingo even if he's a screw-up. Rather than looking at individual themes like we typically do on this show, we chose to examine each of the individual characters in After the Storm because it's important to understand each of their perspectives in order to follow what we believe to be the main point of the film. Hirokazu Koreira here takes a look at what happens when a family once in flux has more or less decided where they stand in relation to one another. Everyone but Ryota seems as though they know what they've gotten out of the failed marriage, with only the deadbeat father still floundering around, trying to find his proper place in this social setting. Given that the entire film is told from Ryota's perspective, we're extremely biased on how everyone interacts with our main man, and what their true ambitions may be. Yet, in spite of this bias, the playing field is leveled by how generally unlikable Ryota comes off in his interactions with the family. Again, this is personal opinion, but from our perspective. This leads to what we think is the point, forcing the audience to ask, who's in the right here? Every character in After the Storm is presented as a set of actions and reactions. In other words, we see the family dynamic after it has been altered by the birth of a child, the death of a parent, and a divorce between two of the same generation. Through observing these strained bonds, we must decide for ourselves which actions are right and which are wrong. In this way, After the Storm then implores us to learn how we can apply these lessons to our own lives and families. After the Storm is something of a sister film to Our Little Sister, the darker, more on-the-nose of the two projects, which shares a lack of a main plot, yet which vicariously allows us to observe the inner goings-on of a family. This plot might sound similar to Koreeda's later project, Shoplifters, with the key distinction there being that the 2018 film looked at a very specific kind of family, with a very specific type of life. In After the Storm, we have a very down-to-earth, average family, in a modern, relatable setting. If you've somehow missed out on After the Storm, and you're into Hirokazu Koreeda's other films, be sure to check this one out. Understated, subtle, and affecting, this isn't exactly feel-good cinema the way his prior film was. Yet it's equally important for both Koreeda's filmography and for modern Japanese cinema. Let us know below what your favorite Koreeda movie is, and where you think After the Storm fits in with his recent filmography. 